Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Alive, alive, it's alive, it's alive! You are listening to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to The Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. It's a podcast where we are breaking down and celebrating the Gene Wilder film, Young Frankenstein, one crazy Igor dance move at a time. I'm Alan Sanders. I'm your host. I'm Walt Murray, your co-host. And joining us from the Airplane Minute, he's decided to go from one brand of wacky, zany humor to another. We've got Dave Smith. Welcome back, Dave. That's been a long climb, but I'm sure tired. <laughs> One contrived dumb ass <laughs> climb at a time. <laughs> yeah. With absolutely no help whatsoever. Right. Don't don't touch him. <laughs> Well, that's actually a perfect place for me to say that because that is where we are starting today with minute number 98. We continue with Dr. Frankenstein, who just got done barking in order at, at Inga and Igor yesterday, saying, don't touch him. We finally find out the the, bar, the back half of that is he wants to do it by himself. And we will end with this crazy dance gesticulations that Igor's doing before he yells, switching off. So let's just go ahead and dive into it. Yesterday, we all had kind of an issue. I'm hopefully a, a good night's sleep. We cleanse the palate. We're, we're feeling positive, right? About minute 98. We're not going to have another dog of a minute, we're hoping. No, I think we're moving in a uh, in a much stronger direction today. Dave, what about you? You feel feel a little bit better because I mean we kind of we kind of hurt some some feelings of people that just think that there's nothing wrong with young Frankenstein yesterday. I'm feeling electrified about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get to it. The barked order continues at the very beginning here. I love the monster's expression because it's a combination of. The- <laughs> you mean no don't help him i'm i'm falling <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i love that immediately when he tells him not to help him he starts sliding back down <laughs> he's like no 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 help me <laughs> i love it. it for the flaw yesterday of how angry he belted the first half of that line to then yell that he you know don't help him he wants to do it on his own to do it by himself i love the fact that it cuts to peter boyle going no no <laughs> Yeah. No, I could use I, some help. I don't know who you think I am, but yes, I will accept your help. <laughs> Please. You didn't even provide me a vine that went all the way up the wall. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just sheer sheer mountain climbing at this point. I mean, this is t- very technical rock climbing. Yeah, because it's a 90-degree it's a, it's a yeah. wall. Yes. <laughs> it's wall climbing. And the rocks are really not even that deep. You know, the, the stucco is... Right up against the edges, so it's a it's a tough one. Maybe he got bit by a radioactive spider along mm, the way. That's a possibility. Could have answered a whole lot if we had done that. Spider Man, Spider Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches seeds just like flies. Look out! Here comes the Spider Man. Absolutely. I mean, we're, I mean, he's already part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Hulk Smash, so why oh, couldn't he also true. have some of the Spidey powers? That's true. So there's a lot there of there over here. Young Frankenstein, the first first Avenger. <laughs> <laughs> no, he gets something. to be the second based on timeline. Yeah, the second Avenger <laughs> or third. Yeah, second. I don't know. <laughs> we're just making crap up as we go. Yeah, we're spitballing. Here's what's interesting with this scene is we've got some lines added. Gene Wilder not only had the line about don't touch him, he wants to do it by himself. That was actually added. That did not, that wasn't part of the script at all. When he starts to yell, you can do it, you can do it. You can do it! You can do it! That was in the script. And then another added line, please... My creation. Please, my creation! So is he yelling, please, like, God, help my creation? Or is he telling the monster, please, my creation? No, that was the line that stood out the most to me in this minute, is he, once again, my creation. This is ultimately him. This is all about him. Um, I mean, that God complex is strong. But where is the plea? I'll ask Dave first. Where is the please being directed? Is he yelling the please to the monster and then calling it my creation? 
Or is he yelling to the heavens first, please? Like, will we just kind of yell out for help from these mystic forces outside of ourselves? Is he just sort of doing a plea to whatever God forces, ESP, whatever, then back to the creature, my creation? Where's the please directed? I've always interpreted it as being directed at the creature. He wants the creature to succeed in his you know, quest to climb the wall, essentially. But it's more of a metaphorical thing. You know, to, to become human is what he really wants him to do. This physical test of, of reaching the top of the wall is, you know, the first step toward the, the, the rest of it. And so I think he's asking the monster, he's really pleading with the monster to make it over the top of the wall, you know, in a physical and a metaphorical sense so that they can get on to the next part. Are you suggesting that this is one of those moments where he's got to get over the hump? <laughs> what hump? <laughs> <laughs> and where is it? Which side? Which I side mean, of the castle? I guess to be if, if we're going to look at it metaphorically, we want him to try to all by himself. You got to try to figure out how to get over that hump. That's right. It's <laughs> sorry, Walt. <laughs> Oh, uh, you, you weren't know, expecting that. Yeah, yeah you, you, you. it's true. <laughs> it is true. It is true. And we actually have a wall here. It's the hump of the wall. He's That's got to right. climb over the hump. He's got to get over the hump of being a creature. <laughs> I told you they're packing there, a lot there in the are last few minutes. Check it out. This yes, one. there are many humps to get over. <laughs> oh, so. well, well, do you Wait, agree with and that? Igor, and, and well, looking at Igor, his hump is on the other, the uh, left side this time. Oh, it's it shifted again. Yeah, yeah. it shifted. I was going to get to that in a sec, but do you agree with Dave that the please is to the creature? Please don't give up on yourself. Please, my creation, you can do it. Yeah, I I, I think so. I think so. I, I think the other possibility is kind of the cry out to the heavens. See, I'm trying to figure out which way it goes, and, I, I, yeah. and Dave really sold me. I'm, I'm feeling... I was sort of 50-50. I felt like all you needed was a feather on one side of the scale or the other to kind of tip me. So I'm kind of leaning toward what Dave said here. I think he is saying to the creature, please, as in sort of like you could almost add, don't give up. Please, I'm begging you. You're my creation. You can do it. Yeah, that's the sense I get. I mean, I could see somebody arguing from more of that humanistic cry out to the the heavens of please. But no, I I think it is more uh, almost like when you're trying to teach your kids to walk. Please keep walking. I get the sense that that's what he's, uh, he's crying out to here. I guess we'll go with that because part of me wanted it to be that it, the pleas was to the heavens or to God or to forces outside of yourself because it would make me feel like at least maybe we're finally seeing Dr. Frankenstein sensing that he's not God anymore. But then he d- follows it right up with my creation, not please do it for yourself. Please, I don't want to see you fall. Please, I love you. It's please. My creation. They still got that, and it's so close to the end of the movie here. Of course, if you don't know the runtime, you might say, oh, how do you know it's close to the end of the movie? Yeah. I just feel like I'm waiting for that final <laughs> change within Dr. Frankenstein. It's not a three-and-a-half-hour Marvel movie. It is interesting, too, that he puts an unrealistic expectation on the creature because he wants him to do it. No, he doesn't want help. And then he's obviously like, yes, I do. I I absolutely want help. But Dr. Frankenstein is putting that on him and saying, please, my creation, you know, don't disappoint me. You know, get up here, make the climb yourself. Again, that odd personality flaw that he has. So I don't know, you guys said you had a, a minister or a priest on before, and you've talked about the philosophical uh, ramifications of this movie. Where do you think Frankenstein lies? Because I have always interpreted him as being just the straight up scientist. Everything is explainable and, and everything works. I just, I wouldn't imagine him calling to the heavens or whatever. Where, where do you think he falls in this Well, sense? we actually have film evidence to show that he does believe in God and that there's things outside of himself because at the very, when the creature is first uh, breaks loose of the castle, right after the whole revelation that Victor Frankenstein was Frau Bluka's boyfriend and he goes crashing through the side gate or side door, Dr. Frank, uh, at this time now, Frankenstein comes out, yells to the heavens and goes, dear God in heaven, what have I done? Which was an homage that Mel Brooks put in here. Mel Brooks growing up in Yiddish theater, the trope in Yiddish theater was at the end of act two of whatever play they were watching. That was sort of a thing you'd have in Jewish plays that at one point the the character realized I did something without God's help. Now I'm going to have to recognize, dear God, what have I done? And so we have that line as the creature escapes. All right, fair yeah. enough. I hadn't uh, seen that in a while. Well, in, in the um, in the reanimation scene too, it is a 
to me, it's a very interesting scene, and I keep replaying it in my mind and rethinking it. And Jody and I, the pastor who was on, have talked about the scene a little bit too. It really strikes me as a, a very interesting scene because he uses the creature as his pulpit. As he's being lifted up, we have a lot of religious imagery, and the speech he gives is one that is very much science over all. Then he does realize uh, in the, the minutes after that that the monster's out of control. His creation has cut loose, and there's nothing he can do to stop it, and that he is not God. But I keep going back and seeing him in his mind wanting to take back control mm-hmm. and wanting to be Wanting an affirmation that he is God, and I that think there, there is that cre- you know that creative power within him. It is a really interesting human study because we're that's how we are. Mm-hmm. No, I think the pendulum continues to swing inside of him. That I, I do think he was heavy science, mm-hmm. but he also was pure science, not this hokey doo doo science of his of his family. Then he discovers, well, maybe it can work, and so he's still onto the science. And now, look, I can create life. Now all of a sudden, I can't control life. Now what have I done? Oh my God, I'm not God. But now right. all of a sudden, he's here. Well, you're my creature, right? I, I do think it continues to go back and forth, and maybe. Maybe in this minute, he'll finally realize what is necessary. If he wants to be responsible for life, you have to do, you can't just enjoy the good times. You have to take the bad with it. And I think he's going to put himself at risk. Well, and I, you know, not being a pastor, but I will use a biblical reference. The Apostle Paul in uh, Romans, I believe, says, you know, even though I have walked away from my old life, I keep returning to those old ideas and those old sins. And I see that in Dr. Frankenstein because he does keep going back to that Mm -hmm. old idea that I am God and that I am the creator, even though I've seen all the disaster that's come from it and all the flaws and errors, I still am the creator and I still am God. So it's a real mixed bag with him sometimes. Yeah, I you know that all makes sense, and and you get uh, you get that with a lot of movie doctors, right? What was the one with the Alec Baldwin? I can't remember. He plays some doctor, and uh, he's in a, he's having some sort of a issue where mistreatment of a patient or something, and and somebody accuses him of having a god complex. He says, "I don't have a god complex. I, I am God." Oh, yeah, so, I know the yes, I know what you're talking about. I know about. exactly what you're talking about. Oh, what is the name of that? Yeah, yeah, but that's I, I think that's the thing there because I bring life. I can ha- I can control what may happen to you because as a doctor, I have the ability to stop the disease. I can stop this from killing you. Therefore, I am God. Yeah. I also think that was one of the strongest parts of Doctor Strange and one of the reasons why of all the Marvel movies that is one of my top two or three because that you know Doctor Strange has that same thing. He equates himself with God, and then he has that car wreck, and his hands don't work anymore. And he realizes that there is more. Mm-hmm. There is something else. It's but it's let me ask you this though: it, it, we're having an interesting. Oh my God, we're getting philosophical now. <laughs> I don't know, we're I don't getting, know if I like very it. deep again. <laughs> but let me ask this question though: in in general, if you're going to go to a surgeon because there's something wrong with you, don't you kind of deep down want them to believe that there's nobody else capable of fixing you? Like they're that good, they have that much belief. Oh, and absolutely, they, and proof in their abilities that maybe it's okay to have a bit of a god complex. Do yeah. I want the schlep to go? Uh, well, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, roll the dice. Let's see how it goes. No, I, I want. Is your insurance all caught up? I want Doctor Strange. I want Hawkeye Pierce. I want the doctor who walks in going, "I've got all the answers." Right. I mean, at some point, don't we expect that to an I, extent of somebody, especially yes. in, the, in the the physicians' field? And I hope the the results of my surgery reaffirm that for him. <laughs> I hope it goes awesome, <laughs> and and that people stand in amazement of my recovery. Well. To a certain extent, yeah, you definitely want your surgeon to have confidence in his ability, his his or her abilities, but you don't want enough arrogance that they that they overlook things and miss things that other people might catch. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, very true. That's what I'm saying. It's it's this fine line we want in in this field anyway. Because okay, Dave, you and I, we both, you do. You're a cinematographer. You're behind the camera. I've got a production company where I've got resources where I bring people in like you and sound people, and I I tend to be the big picture director guy. We want to make our clients feel, we've got it. Don't worry. You can't ever show the client that there's a problem here and make the client lose faith in you because you you have to have almost that sense of overconfidence, but you can't go so far that you actually screw up because then you're going too far the other way. 
Right. And that's, that's a good, good point talking about uh, filmmaking because that's a very collaborative medium and the best filmmakers like directors, directors of photography that I work with, they are confident in their abilities, but they will always listen to suggestions. So can't you can't make a film on your own. It's almost impossible. So you, you got to be able to humble enough to take suggestions from from other people. Yeah, and it's 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 that fine line because if you look like you're a pushover or that you don't have any answers or can't make a decision, you lose the basically the faith of the people around you. And if you won't take any input because you are the smartest person in the room. Just ask me. You're going to lose the the support and, sh- and create bad morale on a set. It's a fine line because you, someone at some point still has to be confident enough to make the decision. We're going forward now. Thanks for all the input. Now let's do it. And I think you need that in whatever business you're in. Uh, when I was a kid, we were uh, fortunate enough to be friends with the Near family, and Mr. Near was the number two guy at Wendy's. And so he was around Dave Thomas all the time. The two of them worked real closely together. And Mr. Near was one of the most creative people I've ever seen. And looking at what Wendy's did over the years, if those two weren't as creative as they were, it wouldn't have have worked. And I, I think you see that in my years at IBM and, and looking at the guy who's well, you, the, the founder of IBM. Well, uh, just both of us having backgrounds in IBM, you knew when you were with the team – that knew how to work well together, and in a team that had the guy that had the God complex. Absolutely. And one of the things that was always interesting to me at IBM is how important creativity was in whatever job you were in. Mm -hmm. And that even though there were rules set forward, when you walked in your boss's office and said, hey, what do you think about this? They may not have agreed with you, but your creativity was appreciated. And Dave, I think you're saying the same thing. I think we both find the most successful shoots are the ones where someone still has a sense of being able to take control and rein it, but at the same time, they need to be open to ideas because you have to accept the fact, hey, I'm not an expert at everything. Yeah, absolutely. And even if you are an expert at everything, you don't see everything necessarily. Oh, I totally agree with that as well. And I think that's why sometimes even with major films, I mean, there's a whole person whose job is to do nothing but follow script continuity. That's that's their job, right? Yeah. Right. There's so many individual roles. And even still, we find errors that sometimes make it into movies because there's so many moving parts. And see, as podcasters, we do know everything. <laughs> and we get to play Monday morning quarterback on all these movies and rip them to shreds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't make one on our own, but... We can exactly. certainly rip somebody else's apart. See, and that and that is the the beauty of being a podcaster is it gives us that uh, that freedom. Getting back to this minute number ninety eight, just as the creature is implored by Doctor Frankenstein, and I, and I like his his tone here is not the angry like it was last minute, which I, that bothered me still. Just the amount of vitriol underneath his voice, but he does shout more encouragingly in a sense. You know, you can do it, basically, please my creation. And the creature does find within him that that reservoir, that well to dip into and pull himself up over the wall. And as he pulls himself over that final bit of exertion, he he starts to pass out. And that's where here comes Freddy with compassion. Quick, catch him! (gasps) Quick, catch him. Don't let him fall. Now, he did it. He climbed. He got over the hump. He's made his he accomplishment. he every bit. Like, he, he left. You know what they say? Leave it all on the field. You know, the expression yes. in sports. Mm-hmm. I, don't wanna, I don't want you guys coming at me, you know, at the end of the game, jumping up, doing jumping jacks and hooting and hollering, and we have lost. It means you, you didn't leave it all on the That's field. Right. You should be exhausted. All out there. And this creature, is that, he's, he, he passes out. He's, he's done. Yeah, and I love. <laughs> sorry, I love the fact that both when the creature is climbing up in the last minute, and uh, Inga and Igor are trying to help him, and now in this minute when he's collapsing, and and Frankenstein tells him to catch him, I'm like, okay, you've got a 300 plus pound <laughs> monster, and you've got a, a, a small woman and a almost a midget of a of a hunchback guy. What are they gonna do exactly? <laughs> Thank God there was the little throne chair there that Igor yeah, was using. They were able to yeah. drop him right in. It's almost like they knew this was going to happen. <laughs> well, and I, why is Dr. Frankenstein still playing the violin? The monster's already here. He's up the wall. He's passed out. He essentially does nothing to help the situation where he really should have uh, helped to keep him from falling back th- over the wall. I think the only reason that he's still playing the melody, besides maybe he's just been playing it for a little while and he's kind of still in that, mo- in that sort of, it's sort of happening automatically, mm-hmm. is we need it for the musical joke. That little miscued note. When Igor says, You realize you're risking both your lives? Well, first of all, 
there's some changes here to the script. And so let's go ahead and, and talk about it. The quick catch him was a change. And then he adds this line, have all the preparations been made for the transference? Have all the preparations been made for the transference? Yes, doctor. Are you sure you want to go through with this? It's the only thing that can save him now. It's supposed to be Igor in the script who says, yes, doctor. They gave it to Inga. So Inga says, yes, doctor. And then Igor says, are you sure you want to go through with this? Freddy says, it's the only, it was supposed to be it's the only way in the script. It changed to, it's the only thing that can save him now. And then Igor says, you realize you're risking both your lives. And the minute he says that is when he hits the wrong note on the violin. Mm -hmm. And we get that little bit of that pained expression like, you know, I kind of knew it. But when you say it out loud, it sounds a whole lot worse. Yes. It's kind of like getting bad news from the doctor. It's like, eh, kind of knew something was wrong. Once it's, really once it's said out loud, you can't take yeah. it back. So if it's just in your head, you can kind of say, well, it's just a random thought. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's funny that he keeps playing the violin. It's like... They told him that he, he needed to provide the soundtrack to his own life. <laughs> <laughs> and that yeah. happens a lot in this movie, by the yes, way. Yes, it does. You're right. It's, it's, it's exactly that, that he's playing the music for the intensity of the scene, but instead of it being in the soundtrack, it's actually being performed live for us. Yeah, it's interesting. There is another uh, change here that I, I want to get one more thing. That Igor, when he says, you realize you're risking both your lives, initially Igor was supposed to say, okay, boss, but I hope you know what you're doing. Yeah, that doesn't give us as good of a joke, does it? <laughs> it's. I, I think it's better for him to say, you realize you're risking both your lives. <laughs> yeah. On the violin. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a subtle little thing, but just that wrong note and the expression on Gene Wilder's face, I think that's the reason more than anything he's got to keep playing the violin is to give us that little bit of the audible joke. It's a heavy scene. He's been saying, you know, my creation, leave him alone. He can do it. He's climbing the wall. He gets up. He finally passes out we got to have at least a little joke before we end. Well, it also points to his narcissism because he is willing to risk other people's lives. But when it comes to risking his own, then it does kind of throw him it off It dawns on him. Well, huh. Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> but, he's still willing to go, but he's still willing to do it. Is this? And this is what I'm wondering. Is this the moment when he realizes his creation could climb the wall by himself and then used every bit of his effort and passes out and he, much like a parent, catch him quick. Don't let him fall. And he's already in his mind said, I've got this idea to help save him. And the guy says, but you know, you could end up dying. He doesn't say no. He, he squeaks the violin, but he doesn't go back on his word. He doesn't say, well, then maybe I shouldn't do it. He just, yes. That's all he says. Yes. Yes. You realize, boss, you're risking both your lives. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that the moment he's decided, maybe I'm not going to play God, but I'm going to at least take responsibility? I think he, he I think he made the decision when they made the plans for what they're about to do, you know, and just the the fact that Igor's reminding him that of the dangers is just I think it's a small thing. I don't I don't think it's a it, you know, it makes him makes him uh, screw up his violin playing for a half a beat, but I think he's he's been committed from from the get-go. So and and I get that cuz obviously he's, have the preparations been made. He didn't want anybody to help the monster over the wall. What would have happened if the monster had slipped and fallen? Would he have still been like, well, we had made all these preparations, but oh well. <laughs> Whoops. Anybody got another dead body around here that we could uh, plug a brain into? <laughs> I just, we don't know about the preparations until after what we're watching unfold. Right. So you're right, Dave. In some sense, he, through the reveal of the dialogue, has already sort of had come up with his idea and they're already ready to do it. I just, it feels... It feels nice to me to see that this is that moment where he's like, I'm willing to risk my life to save this thing that I've done. I'm willing to put my own life on the line now. Before, remember he said that, Walt, when he was going to go in and talk to the creature, don't, whatever you do, don't let me out. And all of a sudden he freaked out, goes, let me out, let me out, let me get it, get, get me the hell <laughs> out of here. Right. Because he initially said, you know, I'm going to take responsibility basically. But then he tries to run and leave. This time he's not running. This time he's not leaving. Right. I want to say on one side that, you know where this is going. I, I want to say that he's got pure motives, but I, he doesn't. I, I think that he knows that the only way for his creation to be fixed and to survive is to risk his own life. And if he doesn't risk his own life, it leaves his creation in this flawed state. And that is a reflection on him. So I think he's willing to risk his own life to fix the creation because ultimately that is he, he wants a perfect creation so that it reflects on him yeah i think he's he's got that egotistical thing going 
uh, I just I feel like we're so far into the movie. I want to give him a sense that we. First of all, we we all love Gene Wilder, so no matter what, even if we look at a flawed character, we're still going to find value in him. I just like to, from a writer's perspective oh, well, or think... storytelling, I'm trying to get to where I can justify that he's made the turn, that he's a he's he's regained some of that humanity of like. I played God, I created this problem, but rather than ignore it, rather than let it go, I'm going to fix it even at the risk of my own life. I want to see some altruistic value to that. Well, as we've said earlier, the monster is really Dr. Frankenstein. Right. I want him to be redeemed. Yeah, I don't I don't personally think that that redemption is quite there. I think there's always going to be that that mix of motives. And I think for Gene as the actor, knowing what kind of person he is, this has got to be a really hard part to play or a really fun part to play because he is not a narcissist. He's not a uh, egotistical. No, jerk. Not, no, the, the man Gene yeah, Wilder. Yeah, Gene himself. Wilder is, is kind of the polar opposite of that. Oh, what a nice guy. And he's playing someone who is almost a totally different person from him. Dave, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Do you see it at all, or am I just – am I looking for the contrived story that I, I something's got to happen to redeem the person, and it's okay to just be flawed? Honestly, I never really thought that deep about this before, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, 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 the fact that he is, he is willing to possibly – to risk his own life at least to help this creature because he could have just let the, you know, the village, you know – riot people uh, take the creature or do whatever i but, mean remember um, earlier he, or he could have shoved him right I, back I, off the wall and I, I, killed him right yeah. he could have let him fall off the wall and dave i want you to finish your point but earlier he he said strap him back down it's better to kill this thing with the rotten brain he mm. was willing to basically destroy this experiment mm. true he so he just definitely has grown well i mean he yeah he has changed a lot over like at first like you said he, he didn't want anything to do with the doo-doo science of his grandfather and then he, the more he learned about it, the more he got into it. And then I guess it's interesting to see how his character deals with setbacks, you know, with the mm. rotten brain bit, with the, you know, no matter what you hear, don't let me out of the cell. And so, yeah, I think it, it just shows his character growth. Well, we'll have to keep watching because obviously I just, I know Gene Wilder is just one of those likable guys, period. You just, every, every, every performance, you just sort of like him. Yeah. But Dr. Frankenstein is a monster. He is truly, mm -hmm. and, and could be very look, looked at through the whole film as a despicable person with nothing redeeming. And I just don't want to do that to Gene Wilder. <laughs> no. And again, I mean, I think it, it emphasizes how great an actor Gene Wilder is to be able to do this. And, I mean, really, a great writer, because he really did a fantastic job writing the character of Dr. Frankenstein, and a great actor to be able to play that part. I think it'd be hard to play a narcissist, because you, you yeah. want that redeeming quality. Right. How do you play the narcissist and still have the audience want to, to like you? That's right. That's right. And, and I do like the character of Dr. Frankenstein here, but he is a very flawed character. As we start to – well, we're going to get into the lab in a second, but as we get to wrap up this first piece here where they're still on the balcony, that is a really, really clean shirt that the monster manages to still be <laughs> wearing really when is. he gets up on the it, top. It is after all he's been through. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> vegetables thrown at him in jail, murders somebody. His kidnaps time in a the girl. Woods, kidnaps a girl. Has uh, seven or eight uh, romps in the hay, for real. Yeah, and then comes back to the castle, climbs, climbs the a, wall. a wall, a castle. That's been a standing for wall. centuries. Yes. A rock wall, and it's pristine white. I want to know where I... Only in Transylvania can dirt not actually blemish right. a white shirt. That's right. That is like a miracle shirt. And he's yeah, still... they serious anti-stain technology. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> Space age fibers keep you clean <laughs> all the time. How do you get shirts so clean, Mr. Lee? Ancient Chinese secret. Yeah, I wish my grandfather was still around to ask him. He ran a dry cleaners. I, I'd love to know his thoughts on what that material must be. I can tell you, if I wear a white shirt anywhere, I will find oh. some way to pick up something. I, if, I, if I had been wearing any other color, nothing. But somehow, a drop of spaghetti sauce will come flying from some yeah. passing. It doesn't matter. I'll have some stain on it the next day. And here's here's you know Mr. Rock Climber and perfect pristine cloth. Yeah, I love no, it. I have my stack of weekend t-shirts and my stack of other t-shirts because I stain everything. <laughs> like, I'll get home and be like, yeah. I didn't even eat spaghetti. What is this? <laughs> exactly. 
I gave up on white clothing a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. I can't do white. Let's go ahead and transition then because we're almost at the end of the minute here. Right around second 45, we have a, a wipe that comes straight down from top to bottom. And we are in a very darkened lab with Dr. Frankenstein, or Frankenstein now, on the left side of the screen in a much brighter lit position. Inga in between the two tables where the monster is strapped to the other table. And in the background, Igor doing some weird little Michael Jackson, <laughs> I don't know, James Brown shuffle up there. Yeah, it is definitely a shuffle. It is a weird dance that he's doing. I mean, is he just trying to look busy? Well, and it's almost like he was sped up. I mean, the scene I mean, he's isn't not sped up. No, he, but he is doing a crazy dance. And it's almost like he does like a choo choo move with yeah. his hands and he kicks his leg out and then he shuffles by and then he does a little butt thing when he's, yeah. it's like he's just performing. The only thing I, I can think of is he's now the boss man. You know, he's now in charge. Dr. Frankenstein is down. The monster's down. He is running the show. And he's just, he's loving it. Yeah, I think it's just basically Marty Feldman doing physical comedy. You know, it's just every little thing he's doing, he's got to amp up with the eyes and the facial expressions and this bit here as well. I just, it's, it's, for me, it's hysterical because it's after hysterical. all this heaviness of the last couple of minutes, yep. And we know it's a heavy procedure. We see there's a skull cap of some kind, some kind of a contraption on top of Gene Wilder's head, on Dr. Frankenstein's head, and then it's, it seems like it's connected at some central point with another one that's on top of the monster's head. And then you've got Igor up there, you know, he's he's turning dials and he's kicking his butt out and then he's shuffling to one side or the other and he's just flipping knobs randomly. It's Igor unleashed. It, it, it is. It's, <laughs> it's Igor gone wild. <laughs> Order now, 1995. <laughs> But then all of a sudden, how does he know it's finished? Besides the fact that he turns around and says, Switching off! How do we know? How do we know it's finished? Because there's no gauges. There's nothing. There's no timer. It's just, he, he just yells, Switching off! Hey, he's, Igoring has been in his family for a lot, for many generations. <laughs> he knows his scientific stuff. <laughs> I know my I way around a lab. That's another great word we've just added to the Wilder Ride Dictionary. <laughs> he just, it's its like he's flicking switches at random. There's no gauge. There's nothing. He's not getting a readout. There's nothing that tells him the time has, he just all of a sudden after doing this like 10 seconds of gesticulation, switching off. Yeah, he's all of a sudden become an, an expert at Frankenscience. And he does this thing before he even says switching off. He kind of looks back over toward Inga and kind of like, Double checks over his right shoulder, his left shoulder, and then cups his hands. She's like six feet from him. <laughs> there really is no explanation for what he's doing. <laughs> and he's flinging his arms up in the air. I mean, he, he's a crazy man. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's awesome. You know, the uh, we cut into the scene and he's in motion already. So I, I, I imagine he's been probably doing this little dance number for about five or ten minutes yeah. already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's just... <laughs> It's it's hysterical. And what I love is instead of his Gordon's fisherman's outfit now, he still has his henchman's robes on, but then he puts the lab coat over it, but keeps the hood over his head. And I can almost hear him doing the I ain't got no body. I ah! ain't got no body and nobody cares for I mean, yuck, da, 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 da. From, uh, from oh. earlier in the, yuck, in the movie. Yuck, da, 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 yeah. Da. <laughs> Well, this is where we are definitely ending the minute. We've got all this uh, electricity going on. We can see the two. Dave, one last comment I want to get from you on this. From a composition perspective, it's obvious that the light is initially on Dr. Frankenstein. We see that he's much more prominently lit. But as Igor is flipping switches, it's like the light is actually pulsing back and forth mm -hmm. between the two. So from a cinematographer's perspective, give me your thoughts on just the lighting of this scene and what we're kind of getting in terms of impression for for the audience? Well, I think from a cinematography perspective, I would call this the throw everything at the wall and see what sticks method. <laughs> you know, they were just trying to get as much action happening. And I think the fact that uh, Frankenstein is lit up and the creature isn't when we open the scene, I think is just a, an effect of the timing. Because I think the lights, the lights have been pulsating between the two gurneys or beds or whatever they are the whole time. And I think it just happened we, when we cut into it, it just happened to be on Gene Wilder. 
But I think the lighting, the the alternating lighting is suggesting or adding to the suggestion that the two of them are connected and something is happening between the two of them. You know, if they had if they had good CGI or if they wanted to use good CGI, the, you would have seen like those those tubes that are connecting their two uh, metal helmets. You would have seen like something flowing back and forth between those, maybe. And that's what I wanted to get your perspective from in terms of because as a cinematographer, you are paying attention to not just where's everybody within the lens, but how is it lit? Are we seeing what we're supposed to see? And how does that help tell the story? And I think that's sort of slow pulsing back and forth. You get the sense that they are interconnected. And I actually, when I look at it this way, I feel... There's stuff flowing back and forth. It's sort of like all of a sudden it's on the doctor side, then it's on the monster side, then it's back to the doctor. Almost like that pulsing as if something is sort of organically moving between them. Yeah, it's a great visual to show that the important piece in this is the monster and Dr. Frankenstein and that there's something going on there. And if, if we remember the line, the, one of the last lines he says is have all the preparations been made for the transference mm-hmm. it's not a it's not like they're doing a a transfusion it's a transference as if there's something more beyond just biological matter back and forth it feels like when you're transferring something that there's a bigger piece it's the the spirit or more of yourself is moving to the other person well and i i may be misdefining the word transference but i thought that when you do a transference it's flipping the two, that moving the identity of one into the other and vice versa. Am I wrong or are they using the word wrong? Well, transference as a as a noun or psycho, a psychoanalysis is the, just the fact of transferring from one person to the other. But from psychoanalysis, the shift of emotions, especially those experienced in childhood from one person or object to another, especially the transfer of feelings about a parent to maybe an, an analyst. Like when you start feel, having feelings mm-hmm. for somebody because they're bringing up emotions of mom or dad and all of a sudden you're putting those emotions on someone else, you're transferring sure. those. So that's what I'm saying. Transference, it's more than... I'm giving somebody a, a transfusion. Right. There's and, and more here, I think. We're, I, that's why I love that word. I love the fact, is the transference ready? We're going to transfer more than just blood or more than just right. spinal fluid. We're going to do more. We're not going to explain what it is, which is good. I don't need to know how many midichlorians need to go from one side to the other. Ugh. I just need to know you brought up that you're bringing a piece. <laughs> you had to pe- go to midichlorians. You know, that's what happens when you explain too much. It becomes stupid. <laughs> right. The fact yeah, is, right. I right, think right, we're right. supposed to just sense that the doctor's willing to give a piece of himself. It's not just biological. There's something else he's transferring onto the creature. Right. And I, I think what I was expecting was that the the brain and the consciousness of Dr. Frankenstein would be given wholly to the monster, and the monster's brain and consciousness would go fully to Dr. Frankenstein's body, instead of just a kind of an inner melding of the two of them. Okay. See, now you're, you're dragging this out. I am. I let am. Me, let, let's and end and with I have this. to remember, it's just a movie. Let's end with this question. No, I like <laughs> it. Let's end with this question. Is that why this process has to be so carefully timed to good, keep it from going, question. from being a complete transference? Well, it, good point, because he says, not a second more. Right. Yeah, the, the whole timing thing is kind of interesting. It kind of reminds me of when you hard boil eggs, you know? It's like you got to you, you boil them and then you turn it off and you got to let them sit for like exactly 14 minutes. And otherwise, and, but you can't really tell. You can't like crack them open and look at them or else you're, you're ruining the egg. That always felt like that for here. So I, I don't know why they, ha- they have this time thing. Which, um, of course, I think you're right. I, I think they're, they are sharing pieces of each other with each other, but it's not clear until later that that's what happened. Um, in fact, when in a future minute, we'll see, you might think that they did swap bodies, right? Mm-hmm. It is interesting that they had, the, I mean, the timer clearly is there for the story reasons so that the people can come in and stop it. And of course, the time actually we don't see until the next minute, I'm just bringing it up now, is to address your concern wall about the transference. So we have to talk about this more tomorrow. So this is a perfect bridge to just leave the audience on a cliffhanger what do we mean by transference? But I and, can't wait till tomorrow. And we already teased <laughs> that time plays a factor into whole and in, into all of this. So as we are wrapping up, then this minute number ninety eight, Dave. Anything else you want to bring up? No, that's all I had. Well, there is something I want to bring up. There's someone missing from this scene, and that is Frau Bluka. Frau Bluka is not she anywhere. She is the one who originally played the. Um, it's the Frankenstein lullaby, right? Mm-hmm. It's the Transylvanian lullaby. Transylvanian lullaby. 
she was the one who originally played it, and she was playing out the violin when she we got into the whole thing with her relationship with the original Dr. Frankenstein. And um, she's nowhere to be seen in, in this scene or in the lab here, and I'm just wondering why they didn't have her as a part of it. I don't know that we have an answer to that. Well, it is awful late. Maybe she's already in bed. It could be. Could be, and I think that it, her presence would change the um, the flow of the scene and, and the chemistry a little bit because we already know that you know she was a very manipulative. She has a vested person, interest in this yeah. working and and working better than it's ever worked before, and which is and, why I was kind of surprised she wasn't in. The I mean, scene. this is her Susukov, her That's sweet right. head. Her so sweet head. well, we'll have to wait and see because you're right, Frau Bluka is noticeably absent at least at this very moment. But again. There's been some sense of urgency. Hurry up. Let's do the transference. Maybe she's already put on her night cream. She's already in bed. <laughs> got the cucumbers on her eyelids and just wearing the earplugs. You know, it's weird noises making, in Transylvania. She's making amends with the horses, you know, trying to get them back on her side. She's had her cup of Ovaltine. She's had her Ovaltine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dave, I know we went a, a little long on this one, but there was a lot of really good discussion. Somebody wants to learn a little bit more about your other podcasts. They've been really interested in your perspective. Where can they go? Yeah. So I do two podcasts right now. One's called Airplane Minute. Um, we analyze the movie Airplane one minute at a time. You can find that at uh, Airplane Minute on Facebook and Airplane underscore Minute on Twitter. And I also do one called Sequel Harder, where we look at great movies and their awful sequels. And uh, that is also Sequel Harder on Facebook and Twitter. And, and we're all over at the com family of podcasts. And Walt, what about the Wilder ride? If somebody just stumbled on this episode because they heard Dave was going to be on it, go, well, we like Dave from Airplane Minute, and they just, and they decide, you know what? Might be worth going back and checking some of these other episodes. Where can they get all of it? The best place to go is to iTunes. Go and find us on there, the Wilder ride, and uh, subscribe to our podcast. And if you like what you're hearing, we would really appreciate it if you take a minute to give us a five-star rating and to let us know why you've given us that rating. And that is important. We've got this crazy algorithm that iTunes uses. So if you give us the five-star rating, you also want to make a comment that kind of triggers in that crazy iTunes world that you really mean business and it helps other people find our podcast. And come on back tomorrow, everyone, because we want to continue this scene. We want to find out what is this experiment that Igor is switching off all these machines about. And so we will start minute number 99 with machines still running and Igor eventually switching them all off. And we will actually end with an angry mob breaking through the front door of the castle von Frankenstein. So the mob finally makes its reappearance. They finally figured out how to get back to where they started. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right. Come on back tomorrow for this, The Wilder Ride. And we may get to see, or maybe not get to see, Frau Bluka. <laughs> my creation. He fussed my boyfriend. 